The phone rang, slicing through the silence of my modest living room. I, Emily Townend, a 38-year-old working mother, never expected that call to shatter the life I knew. Emily, I'm leaving you. Michael's voice, once so familiar and comforting, was now cold, detached. My heart sank. I found someone else. Oh, and there's about $250,000 of debt in your name. Handle it, will you? He said. I stood there, foam still in hand, feeling as if the ground had been yanked from under me. Tears welled up in my eyes, not just for the betrayal, but for the sheer impossibility of the debt he'd saddled me with. Mom, are you okay? Anna, my ten-year-old daughter, walked in, her small face etched with concern. I forced a smile, masking my turmoil. Yes, sweetheart, I'm fine, I said, but Anna wasn't fooled. She hugged me, a gesture offering more comfort than she knew. After Anna went to bed, I sat alone, the weight of my new reality suffocating me. How could Michael do this to us? We had a life, a family, and now I was alone, buried under a mountain of debt I had no knowledge of. I logged into our online banking, hoping Michael's call was just a terrible mistake. My heart sank further as I saw the near-empty account. Michael had drained everything, leaving only a trail of unpaid bills and maxed-out credit cards. I didn't sleep that night. Instead, I spent hours staring at the ceiling, grappling with the betrayal. Michael, the man I had loved and trusted, had turned my life into a nightmare, and the worst part, I had no idea how to wake up from it. Before the turmoil, there was a time when laughter filled our home. I met Michael at a charity event. He was charming, his smile infectious. I remember thinking how lucky I was when he asked me out. Those initial dates blossomed into a whirlwind romance. We were young, in love, and the world seemed full of possibilities. Our wedding was a modest affair, but it was perfect, surrounded by close friends and family. I felt like the happiest woman in the world. When Anna was born two years later, our joy multiplied. She was our little miracle, a perfect blend of Michael and me. Those early years were filled with simple pleasures, picnics in the park, movie nights cuddled on the couch, and Anna's laughter echoing through our home. I often found myself marveling at our little family, feeling a sense of contentment I never thought possible. But as Anna grew, so did the distance between Michael and me. It started subtly, missed dinners, late nights at the office, and weekends consumed by urgent work calls. I tried to bridge the gap, arranging date nights and family outings, but Michael always had an excuse. Then came the job losses. Michael's excuses grew thin as he hopped from one job to another. With each new position, his demeanor darkened. The loving man I married was slowly replaced by a stranger. One evening, trying to discuss his job situation, his response still echoes in my mind. What do you know about pressure, Emily? You just sit at home taking care of Anna. You don't understand what it's like in the real world. His words stung. As Michael's behavior became increasingly erratic, I returned to the workforce. It wasn't just for financial stability. It was to fill the growing void in my heart. I miss the connection we once had the sense that we were a team. Looking back, those signs were there, warning me of the storm that was about to hit. I just chose to ignore them, clinging to the memory of the man I fell in love with, hoping he would return. The unraveling of our life began with whispers of doubt and ended in a cacophony of betrayal. As Michael's job instability grew, so did the tension in our home. His once sporadic late nights became the norm, each time he stumbled in, reeking of alcohol. A part of my heart crumbled. 
One evening, as I was putting Anna to bed, she asked, Mommy, why is Daddy always mad? Her innocent question pierced me. Daddy's just tired from work, sweetie, I answered, though I knew the truth was far more complicated. The final straw came when I discovered a series of receipts for expensive jewelry and hotel stays. Confronting Michael led to a ferocious argument, the first of many. You're suffocating me, Emily, he yelled. I need some space, some freedom. Freedom? Is that what you call spending our savings on whatever this is? I countered, holding up the receipts. He snatched them from my hand, his eyes blazing. You wouldn't understand. You're just a housewife. What do you know about living a life? I stood there stunned as he stormed out, slamming the door behind him. His words, so callous and dismissive, echoed in my mind. Was this really the man I married? Determined to protect Anna and myself, I made the decision to return to work. My old job at the marketing firm welcomed me back, and I threw myself into it. The work was a welcome distraction from the chaos at home, Yet, as I worked late into the night, a gnawing feeling of guilt consumed me. I was missing precious moments with Anna. All because of Michael's selfishness. It wasn't fair. She didn't deserve this. The nights grew lonelier. Michael's presence in the house became like a ghost. There but not really. His indifference towards Anna, his once cherished daughter, hurt the most. He was slipping away from us, and I felt powerless to stop it. It was during these dark times that I found solace in my friendship with Rachel. She became my confidant, my rock. You're stronger than you know, Emily, she would often tell me. I wanted to believe her, but the shadows of doubt were overwhelming. As I lay in bed each night, listening to the silence of the house, I couldn't help but wonder where it all went wrong. When did the love and laughter turn into resentment and distance? The answers eluded me, much like the remnants of the happy life we once shared. Life as I knew it had become a juggling act, balancing work, motherhood, and a crumbling marriage, leaving me perpetually exhausted. Each day was a struggle to maintain a semblance of normalcy for Anna who remained my beacon of hope. One evening, after a particularly grueling day at work, I found Anna sitting at the kitchen table, her homework spread out in front of her. Mom, can you help me with this? She asked, pointing to a math problem. As we worked through the problem, my phone buzzed. It was Rachel. Emily, are you okay? You sounded off at work today she said. I sighed, feeling the weight of everything pressing down on me. Tired of everything, I murmured. Anna looked up at me, concern filling her eyes. Mom, you're working too hard. Can't Daddy help? Her question pierced me, a reminder of the painful truth. Michael's presence in the house had become almost non-existent. When he was home, his disdain was palpable. Our interactions were limited to brief, bitter exchanges, often culminating in him storming out. The climax of our deteriorating relationship came one rainy night. Michael arrived home late, his clothes drenched, his eyes wild. I lost my job. He blurted out, a mix of anger and desperation in his voice. The following weeks were a blur. I worked tirelessly, consumed by financial worries and the well-being of Anna. The strain took its toll, and my health began to falter. But I couldn't stop. Too much depended on me. Then, one fateful day at work, the world spun and darkness engulfed me. I woke up in a hospital bed, Rachel and Anna by my side. The doctor's words were a wake-up call. You need to slow down, Emily. Your body can't handle this stress. Lying in the sterile hospital bed, a myriad of tubes and monitors attached to me, 
I couldn't help but feel defeated. The doctor's diagnosis was clear. Stress-induced exhaustion, compounded by the early stages of an ulcer. But the real shock came when they found a small malignant lump in my breast. Mom, you're going to be okay, right? Anna's voice trembled with fear. I squeezed her hand, mustering a smile. Of course, honey, mommy's a fighter, remember? Rachel, ever the supportive friend, was there too, her face etched with worry. Emily, you need to take care of yourself. You can't keep going like this, she said. I knew she was right, but the thought of slowing down, of letting Michael's irresponsibility win, was unbearable. Yet the reality of my health situation was a wake-up call. I had to be there for Anna. As I lay in the hospital, processing my diagnosis, my phone rang. It was Michael. His voice was as cold and distant as ever. Heard you're in the hospital. Bad timing, Emily. I need you to deal with some things, he said callously. Michael, I have cancer. I said, the words heavy on my tongue. There was a pause, and for a moment, I thought I heard a hint of concern in his voice. But then he said, well, that's your problem. I have my own issues to deal with. I ended the call, a mix of anger and disbelief churning inside me. How could the man I once loved be so heartless? The next few days were a whirlwind of tests and consultations. Amidst it all, Rachel and Anna were my pillars, their love and support unwavering. But as I lay there, a plan began to form in my mind. Michael had left us in shambles, but I wouldn't let him destroy us. It was time for him to face the consequences of his actions. With Rachel's help, I started digging into our finances. The more I uncovered, the angrier I became. Michael had not only amassed a huge debt in my name, but had also been siphoning money from Anna's college fund. The final straw came when I discovered he'd taken out a second mortgage on our house without my knowledge. The depth of his deceit knows no bounds, I told Rachel. We need to do something. Rachel nodded, her eyes fierce. Don't worry, Emily. We'll make him pay for this. He won't get away with it. The day I left the hospital marked the beginning of a new chapter. I was weak physically and emotionally, but my resolve was stronger than ever. Armed with evidence of Michael's financial treachery, Rachel and I devised a plan to confront him and bring his deceit to light. Emily, you won't believe this, Rachel said one day. Michael's working at a tech startup now, and guess what? It's in the same building as my office. This was our chance. We decided to confront him there in a public place where he couldn't avoid us. The next day, with Anna safely at a friend's house, Rachel and I headed to Michael's workplace. My heart pounded as we entered the building. We found him in the lobby, chatting and laughing with a younger woman. Michael, I called out, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. He turned, his smile faltering as he saw me. The woman beside him, presumably CLA, looked on puzzled. What are you doing here, Emily? Michael's voice was a mix of annoyance and surprise. I stepped forward, Rachel by my side. We need to talk. I said firmly, talk about the debts, the mortgage, and everything you've stolen from Anna and me. Michael glanced around nervously, aware of the curious eyes on us. Not here, Emily. This isn't the place, he protested. No, Michael. You don't get to decide that anymore, I said firmly. You've left me with a mountain of debt, and I have cancer because of the stress you've caused. It's time you faced up to what you've done. CLA turned to Michael, betrayal etched on her face. Is that true, Michael? He had no words, just stood there, trapped in the web of his own lies. It was a small victory, 
but seeing him exposed for who he truly was in front of CLA and his colleagues gave me a sense of justice. As Rachel and I left the building, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. The road ahead was still daunting, but for the first time in a long time, I felt like I had the upper hand. Michael would no longer control our lives. It was time for him to pay for his actions, and I was just getting started. After the confrontation, our next step was legal action. Rachel, ever the resourceful one, connected me with a sharp, no-nonsense lawyer, Diane. She was a force to be reckoned with and exactly what I needed. Diane pored over the documents I had gathered. We have a strong case, she assured me. Not only can we sue for the debts he incurred in your name, but we can also go after him for fraud and emotional distress. The idea of taking Michael to court was daunting, but it was necessary. He had to be held accountable. Meanwhile, Rachel kept an eye on Michael's movements. He's unraveling. Emily CLA left him, and it looks like his job is on the line. Too good, I thought. He was finally feeling the weight of his actions. The day of the court hearing arrived. Michael was there, looking deflated, a far cry from the confident man he once was. As the proceedings began, it became clear that the evidence against him was overwhelming. Michael's lawyer tried to paint him as a man who had simply made some financial missteps, but Diane tore through their arguments. She presented the evidence of his fraudulent activities, his draining of Anna's college fund, and the impact of his actions on my health. The judge was sympathetic to our case. Mr. Townsend, your actions have caused significant harm to your family. It's clear you acted with deceit and selfishness. The courtroom was silent as the judge delivered the verdict. Michael was found liable for the debts and ordered to pay restitution. Additionally, he would face criminal charges for his fraudulent activities. As we left the courtroom, Michael tried to approach me. Emily, I am sorry, he said. I looked at him, feeling a sense of closure. Your apologies mean nothing now, Michael. You're going to face the consequences of what you've done. Walking out of that courtroom, I felt a sense of empowerment. It wasn't just about the legal victory. It was about standing up to the man who had tried to break me. I had fought back and won. The battle was over, but the war was not. There were still challenges ahead. My health, rebuilding my life, ensuring Anna's future. But I faced them with a newfound strength. Michael Townsend would no longer cast a shadow over our lives. It was time for Anna and me to step into the light. The aftermath of the trial marked the beginning of a new life for Anna and me. The victory in court was more than just a legal triumph. It was a reclaiming of our dignity and strength. Yet the true battle lay in rebuilding our lives from the ruins Michael had left behind. I returned to work with a renewed focus, determined to provide a stable and loving home for Anna. She was flourishing in school, her resilience a constant source of pride for me. We had weathered the storm together, and our bond had only grown stronger. Rachel was a regular visitor, always bringing warmth and laughter into our home. You know, Emily, you're an inspiration. She said to me one evening as we sat in my living room, a sense of peace finally settling around us. I smiled, looking over at Anna, who was engrossed in a book. I had a good teacher. I replied, my eyes meeting Rachel's. We had been through so much, but her friendship had been a guiding light through the darkest times. As for Michael, his downfall was swift. The loss of his job and reputation, coupled with the legal repercussions, had taken their toll. He tried to reach out a few times, perhaps seeking forgiveness or pity, but I had closed that chapter of my life. I was no longer the woman he had left in shambles. I was stronger, wiser, and free from his toxic presence. The journey wasn't easy. 
There were moments of doubt and fear, but each step forward was a testament to our resilience. Anna and I had not just survived. We had thrived. One evening, as I tucked Anna into bed, she looked up at me with those big, bright eyes. Mom, we're going to be okay, right? She asked. I nodded, brushing a strand of hair from her face. Yes, sweetheart, we're going to be more than okay. We have each other, and that's all we need. As I turned off the light and left her room, I felt a sense of contentment. Our future was uncertain, but it was ours to shape. The scars of the past would always be there, but they no longer defined us. In the quiet of the night, I sat by the window, gazing at the stars. Life had thrown us into turmoil, but we had emerged stronger. We had faced our challenges head on and reclaimed our lives. This was our new dawn, a time of healing and hope. And as I looked up at the night sky, I knew that no matter what lay ahead, Anna and I would face it together with courage, love, and an unbreakable spirit.